welcome along. We're glad you, you've been able to join us today. So our webinar today, we're going to be focusing on how to improve um, our period health, our fertility, and by and large, our overall wellness, because our menstrual cycles certainly can Im impact our overall well wellness. Um, who's this webinar for? Firstly, um, it's for anybody who wants to understand how charting your menstrual cycle can give you insights um, into your health, not only your menstrual cycle health, but your overall well-being. Um, we don't mind if you don't want to put your camera on. Um, that's fine. Stay anonymous if you like, no pressure. Um, there's a chat box as well. Feel free to pop in any comments, any questions as we go through the webinar today. Um, we will try to answer any questions that you pop in as best we can, time permitting. Um, there's already been quite a number of questions submitted. Thank you so much for that. We'll be answering some of them during the webinar, um, but for the rest, we're going to provide some answers and send it out in the pack that you'll receive after the webinar. So everyone who signed up will be able to benefit from those questions and answers. And we're recording the session. So if you don't manage to watch it all today or you've got to pop out, that's okay. We'll be sending that along in the pack later on as well. So today we have myself, Melanie Angus, I'm a certified fertility awareness educator and over at TempDrop, I take care of the user experience and also a lot of input into education. And we're really happy to have with us today, Dr. Mona Wiggins. Dr. Mona is a fertility awareness educator as well, a doctor of nursing practice and a holistic hormone health coach. So thank you for coming along, Dr. Mona. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. And that's really nice. And we're, we're really looking forward into your inputs into, you know, cycle health, hormone health and overall well-being, being able to fix the problems that we can identify through charting. Oh, gone the wrong way. So in our last webinar, part one, if anybody hasn't watched that yet, um, it is available <coughs> on YouTube. And when you signed up, you may have um, seen the link there to the video. So certainly go back and watch that one if you have the opportunity, because it'll help fill in some details for this webinar, which is part two. So what we did learn last time is that our body provides the data so that every day when we're cycle tracking, popping things on our chart, um, we get so much data about our menstrual cycle health and also our overall wellness. The key to accessing that is making sure that we consistently chart that, um, observe it each day and pop it on a chart. Um, and primarily, um, we want to chart the biomarkers of basal body temperature and cervical mucus at the very least. We can chart other symptoms um, such as, you know, LH tests, things like that, other fertility signs, but at least if we can pop on the chart our BBT and our cervical mucus, that's going to go a long way into giving us information about what's happening with our hormones. Then with our charts as well, we can add our other symptoms, things like headaches, PMS, um, cramping, bloating. So those sort of negative symptoms that we experience by recording those, we can start making the connections between our hormones and these other symptoms to, to give us more information. And then putting all that information together, it'll give us what we need to understand how to support our body, how to support our hormones, and then have that overall effect on our overall wellness. Now, this is obviously, if we're trying to conceive, that's, that's very important. That's when we might focus in on it more. But even if, it, if we're not trying to conceive, having hormone balance is so essential um, to our bodies. So whether we're trying to conceive or not, this information is for all of us. But today, that's what we learned. Last time, we're going to look into some specific chart examples, get a better understanding of these, the two primary hormones, estrogen and progesterone, and then what we can do to help our bodies heal and balance naturally. So I'd like to hand over now to Dr. Mona, who's going to run through the essentials of our primary hormones and how they work within our cycle. So, um, Mel, are you running the PowerPoint or should I be doing that? Um, like I'm running, I'm running that for okay. you. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So, um, 
Yeah, like Mel said this, um, I really wanted to kind of go through just a little bit of the basics of the hormones and really what this infographic is meant to describe is the constant hormonal feedback loop that's going on within our cycles. So each cycle, our brain and our ovaries that are down by the uterus are in constant communication. So at the beginning of the cycle, it's the brain triggering the ovaries to start producing an egg towards ovulation. And then as that egg develops and it's ready to be ovulated, it, it's then triggering the brain to release a further hormone to cause ovulation. And then as our cycles go on, it's just this constant back and forth between the brain and the ovaries. And in order for the necessary hormones to occur in order for our cycles to play out as we'd like them to, that really requires sufficient hormone levels. And so that's why understanding really the underneath of the hormones is key for understanding what's going on within our cycles. And so this was just from last time, but just a little bit of a reminder. So this is showing a full menstrual cycle. So from the start of one period, all the way through until the end of your cycle or the beginning of another period. And we can divide our cycles into two various phases. So one would be the follicular phase, which is this beginning part of the cycle. And the follicular phase goes really from the start of your period up until ovulation. And this is really after we have our bleed, this is when FSH or our follicle stimulating hormone comes in and starts telling the ovaries to begin to grow and develop an egg towards ovulation. As our ovaries are developing that egg towards ovulation, that um, inside the follicle is producing estrogen. And estrogen is really what comes in in rising in high amounts. You can see that in the pink line here on the slide. And as we're working towards ovulation and developing that follicle, estrogen is rising and then becomes extremely high at those peak amounts, which is what actually triggers ovulation. It triggers our brain to release LH, luteinizing hormone. That's what we do the P test strips on. And that surges right before ovulation. But that happens because our estrogen is able to rise to significant high amounts. And as our estrogen is rising, what we're seeing in our charts is an increase in that fertile cervical mucus. And again, once we reach those high amounts, that's when we should be able to identify ovulation in our chart. And then we move in to the luteal phase. And so the luteal phase is after ovulation until the end of the cycle. And so I like to think of the follicular phase as being more about menses and our estrogen rising and hitting peak amounts. And our luteal phase, though we do have a second peak of estrogen, is really mainly about progesterone. So that is what causes our temperatures to rise, which is how part of how we can um, identify ovulation in our charts. And it's also what causes our cervical mucus to dry up or return to baseline. And the luteal phase length, so how long it is, is also reflective of how healthy our progesterone levels are or how healthy that corpus luteum is. So when the egg is released from your follicle, that follicle turns into something called the corpus luteum. And that's what's actually producing progesterone. So it's a temporary endocrine gland that lasts throughout the luteal phase. So your luteal phase is more predictable versus the follicular phase is gonna be variable in your cycle. And this is really um, a chart that just, kind of highlights the fact that while we think of estrogen and progesterone as key hormones for our cycles, they actually play a really large role in our health overall. And they really are this 
yin yang beautiful balance that we need adequate estrogen and adequate progesterone in order to find that harmony and that balance not only within our cycles and our hormones but within various things in our body like our blood vessels the health of our bones our blood sugar um, brain health and just our overall well-being and mental health <laughs> I think we're having some internet issues. Oh, Mel, you're muted too, by the way. Sorry about that. A few technical that's difficulties. Okay. okay. Yeah. And that's that's some um, really great information. And I want to jump in with a question from our audience um, here. Now we talked about, you know, where ovulation sits, the follicular phase, the uh, the luteal phase. What about this question is my ovulation is late in the cycle. It's on day 18 and my period starts on day 29. Um, then if it's a shorter cycle, ovulation's on day 14 and my period starts on day 24. Is there a way to move ovulation? Can you, can you influence ovulation so that it falls within the middle of the cycle? And then can you also influence things to prolong the luteal phase of the cycle? Yeah, so I think um, this is a great question from many, I would say like many pieces. I think for one, when I'm looking at this, I think something that's helpful for us all to understand is what are the normal parameters of a cycle, which mm -hmm. is gonna be different depending on what resources, what provider you're talking to. So, to me, I like to see cycles that are 24 to 36 days. So in both of these cases, you know, the 24 is falling on the shorter end, but still technically on the normal side. And follicular phases can be anywhere. So again, the beginning part of the cycle until ovulation, anywhere from 11 to 20 days. And so I think, um, you know, the late ovulation in quotes, I think highlights the point of really the myths and misconceptions that happen around when ovulation should occur. Just because ovulation doesn't occur on 14 days, on day 14 doesn't mean anything is necessarily wrong. It's more about the overall patterns of a cycle. In the luteal phase, uh, again, the corpus luteum, that's temporary. So that can last anywhere from nine to 18 days. I really like to see that like 12 to 16 days, I would say is more ideal. And so in talking about prolonging the luteal phase, I would say like that is something that depending on what else is going on, sometimes a 10 day luteal phase can be totally sufficient as long as there's not other symptoms or things going on. So really, I think remembering like we are all individuals and we're not going to meet perfect cycle standards. So also that is part of it is really like looking, you know, at patterns overall, understanding our patterns over time. And really anytime uh, we're talking about cycle health, we're always, you know, even if we're specifically talking about the luteal phase, it often is again, remembering that balance between estrogen and progesterone. And really, I would say to me, when it's something that you know, this is a, an example that seems, you know, I don't know if there's symptoms or other things going on, but seems to be pretty um, minimal as far as what I would say concerns might go. And so really focusing on key pillars of hormonal health, which we'll be going over in the slides to come. But to me, that's always key for first addressing anything that we're trying to improve in our cycles. Are we getting in regular movement? Are we making sure to address stress in a way that's supportive because we know we can't just get rid of it all together? Are we getting in adequate nutrients that are necessary for our cycles and our hormone health? Is our gut and our liver getting love? Are we supporting the detoxification process and movement of hormones through our body? And are we getting enough sleep because our sleep affects our hormones and our cycles directly. So I would say like that's, those are beautiful places always to start. And I think in this case, it like is, would be a great example. 
Yeah, thank you for that. So I guess the, the important thing is to take a look at whether you have regular big variations, like, like you said, both of these cycles fall within normal parameters, but is there regular large variations in that? And regularly short luteal phases is something that you first got to address. Is it just a one-off or is right. this, you know, becoming a pattern? But great Probably. little key pillars there that you've mentioned mm -hmm. that can run through to any case of, yep. um, of poor menstrual health. So let's jump in now and have a look at a case study about poor progesterone levels. So I'll pop up the slide and run us through what's happening here. So in this chart, what we're seeing is you can see, I think we kind of are highlighting the fact that this is, you know, quote unquote, a, a regular cycle. So mm -hmm. a 28 day cycle, if we weren't paying attention to anything else, if we weren't cycle charting, looking at our BBT, at our cervical mucus, we might say like everything is great because we're having 28 day cycle. But when you start to look at it here, we can see that our fertile cervical mucus, so that's starting on day seven and is going through day 15. So potentially a little bit on the long side, quite a few days of that super fertile estrogenic cervical mucus may or may not indicate some higher levels of estrogen going on, um, especially with the fact that after ovulation, it takes, you know, three days for us to fully clear that, you know, that gives us like a 10 day, I think, fertile cervical mucus window. I'm just like guessing it, basing on looking at the chart. So, you know, potentially on the longer side for fertile cervical mucus. And then with ovulation here, you can see that we are having a weaker thermal shift. So ideally there's more of a difference between our lower temps that are gonna occur in that follicular phase and the higher temps that are coming in our luteal phase. So with that, um, you know, it's one of those charts that you're like, okay, anytime I think of there being, you know, potential issues in the luteal phase, we have to remember again, that estrogen and progesterone are yin and yang. So they balance each other out. So is, our, is our luteal phase not looking ideal because our progesterone is too low and estrogen is normal, or is it not looking quite right because our progesterone looks good and is a totally fine level, but our estrogen is too high. So in comparison, the progesterone is gonna be too low. And so in this one, you know, so we see a 14 day luteal phase, but also I think there's some questionable attempts in there. And depending on the rules you're following, that might change the length of that luteal phase. So when you start to see potential issues in your luteal chart, um, what that might look like, again, is a weak temperature shift where it's just not as clear the difference between the patterns. It might look like a shorter luteal phase. So when we're getting into those like nine, 10 or less days, or it may look like PMS symptoms that are showing up. Often those are gonna show up in that like later part of the luteal phase. Some common um, PMS symptoms, so that stands for premenstrual syndrome. So by definition, that's pre -mency, so in our luteal phase, but that can be anything from irritability, anxiety, depression, maybe headaches, sleeping difficulties, spotting, irregular bleeding, having issues with miscarriages, infertility, low libido, um, weight or fat increases, also um, fluid retention, so you can have breast tenderness or ovarian cysts can go with that too. And um, some of the key root causes of luteal phase deficiencies are one would be like normal hormonal shifts going on. So in that perimenopause, menopausal phase is normal for us to begin to develop lower levels of progesterone because progesterone again is directly related to our ovulation. And those are times either when we're not ovulating or we may be ovulating less frequently. Same with anovulation. Stress is a really common cause of luteal phase deficiency because um, 
it affects the robustness of our ovulation and our hormone balance. And it also can cause us to kind of burn through that progesterone faster. Um, over exercising or excessive amounts of weight loss can lead to luteal phase defects and also um, nutritional deficiencies. So especially thinking about vitamin A, B6, C, and zinc. Um, endocrine disruptors can also affect, again, that estrogen progesterone balance and our hormones. And also um, thinking about potential medical conditions like thyroid disease or having prolactin that's off. And so what can you do if you start to notice luteal phase deficiencies in your cycle? So again, those key pillars of hormone health, um, I stuck them in each of these slides, but I would just really encourage you that anytime you're looking at your cycle and you're trying to figure out what's going on, you're not sure where you need support, come back and look at these five things over and over and just say like, is there somewhere that I can support myself in movement and making sure that I'm getting adequate nutrients and a common thing that I see as far as a mistake in dieting is not getting our macronutrients. So are you getting enough fat, enough protein? I would say those are the key ones, like healthy fats and protein. Um, and also like complex carbohydrates, like are we getting everything that our body needs in order to have cellular health and ovulation? Um, addressing stress, making sure that we're getting seven to nine hours of sleep at night in a dark, cool space, ideally without much interruption. And really thinking about the health of our gut. So our gut has an entire microbiome dedicated to processing estrogen. So super key in our hormonal health, are you having regular bowel movements and making sure to address the health of your liver, two things which are really key in moving out excess hormones from our body. And then you can also, you know, when we've addressed those key things, additional support can be used through either nutrients or botanicals, vitamin C, Vitex and ashwagandha have all been studied to be helpful for um, progesterone levels. Vitex is one that gets talked about a lot. It's a great resource, especially when we're looking at estrogen and progesterone. Um, I would say like generally avoid in pregnancy and anytime you're using herbs or botanicals, if you're not familiar with them, I always encourage people to talk with a medical provider about it. By text, they don't recommend using more than three months unless you're working with a healthcare practitioner. Um, but some really great resources to look into. And then this one is just really showing kind of like an ideal hormonal response. So when we're actually looking to address a luteal phase defect, and um, I think in this example, the woman had done some work with liver health, and I forget, um, Mel, maybe Vitex, was that also used in this example? It was used, yes, Vitex, okay. and also maca powder was another, another one okay. that was used. Yeah. yeah, so maca, great for hormones, also can be helpful for supporting our adrenals. Um, and so here you can see, you know, an improved pattern in our cervical mucus, so is shortened, we have um, better resolution of or like a better clearing of fertile cervical mucus in the luteal phase once that comes in. And then also we have a much bigger shift in our temperatures. And so um, in this cycle, it's showing 12 days. Again, the other one I think was 14 days, but uh, is a less clear to the shift. So 12 to 14 days, both healthy. Our luteal phase really shouldn't shift by more than like one or two days per cycle. So even that being two days would be an improvement, but improved temp pattern, improved cervical mucus. And um, this woman also reported decrease in bothersome symptoms. So all great responses with really like minimal intervention. Yes. So what about similar PMS symptoms? So again, we talked about the fact that PMS is by definition, something that comes within our luteal phase. And we already talked about a lot of the common symptoms. So if you're experiencing those, again, go back to those key pillars of hormonal health and um, diet, things that can be especially helpful with PMS, making sure that we're looking at 
potentially decreasing or totally removing caffeine, excess sugars. So we're not talking about what comes in, you know, fruit, berries, but really like added sugars in our diet, processed foods, and then unhealthy dietary fats. Um, considering adding in magnesium is a fabulous one for PMS, as well as B6. Um, and then Vitex, if you feel like you need that hormonal support. Um, but I would say like magnesium is probably one of the most common deficiencies that I see, especially in women. A lot of studies have shown that we tend to be low in that. So that is one of my absolute go-tos for PMS and cycle health. Um, and, you know, seeking care when we're having more severe symptoms or if they're not improving, seeking care, considering testing of, you know, at a minimum, our estrogen and progesterone levels or doing more detailed hormone testing like the Dutch test and, and always considering thyroid testing when we're seeing cycle abnormalities because our thyroid and our ovaries have such a direct connection and we're often gonna see shifts in our cycle charts before we even have over thyroid disease. Yeah, nice. Another common um symptom is menstrual headaches or menstrual migraines ones that coincide um, with our period so let's yeah. take a uh, take a look at this this type of headache what can you tell us about it so when we're thinking about you know a regular headache versus a menstrual migraine I think it's helpful to remember a menstrual migraine should be just that something that's happening around menses so this case is a good example. So usually with menstrual migraines, those are going to occur usually somewhere between two days before or three days after the onset of a period. So those are kind of like the time ranges that we're thinking about when we're thinking about a menstrual headache. And I think the next slide, yeah, goes into a little bit more about menstrual migraines. So migraines um, again, like a menstrual one around the time of menses, migraines in general are something that tend to be intermittent, meaning that they're not going to last a long time. They shouldn't be coming throughout your cycle if it is a true menstrual migraine. Um, migraines typically are going to be felt on one side of the head and might be associated with nausea, vomiting, light or sound sensitivity. And when it comes to menstrual migraines, it's thought to be estrogen associated. So when we have a drop in our estrogen, after we've had higher levels, that drop is thought to trigger the migraine. So for example, when we're in our menses and at the end of the luteal phase, that's when our hormone levels are at an overall low. And another common time that um, some women might experience them is postpartum after we have that drop in estrogen levels. And so, um, things to consider when we're thinking about the cause. So yes, estrogen is common. Other common causes or things that might be contributing to the headaches can be stress, sleep issues, and um, having blood sugar imbalances or fasting, and um, either food sensitivities or food triggers. Food triggers are a really common one for migraines. So that can include um, kind of like the common triggers are MSG, uh, processed meats like sandwich meats, um, fish, cheese, and um, some dairy products, alcohol, especially like the nitrates that we find in wine, and um, aspartame and other fake sweeteners. And then also having nutritional deficiencies, smoking, and then for some people, environmental things like smells, allergies, things like that. So if you notice it, you just want to keep a headache journal that can be incredibly helpful in understanding what are your triggers, where are the patterns, and really, again, those key pillars of hormonal health, making sure that you're addressing those. And um, dehydration and stress are common triggers, so I would especially pay attention to those and the food triggers we discussed. And then another common thing that I see is medication overuse. So when we are getting regular headaches when we begin to use medication regularly for it. Our body starts to feel like it needs that. And then we can actually get rebound headaches or more headaches because we're taking so much medication. So really trying to 
titrate off using medication and do more natural approaches like heat or cold packs, massage, yoga, acupuncture, and really saving medication for when it's absolutely necessary. Um, and again, um, nutrients and botanicals, so ones that can be helpful for more chronic headaches can be magnesium, vitamin B2, um, fever hue, and ginger. Ginger is also helpful for um, nausea or like vomiting that can go with it. Ginger can be helpful for that. And um, with the fever few, again, you just would want to avoid in pregnancy, but mainly we're talking about menstrual migraines here. So it doesn't super apply. Um, and always seek care if you're, you know, if it's a new sudden severe headache, if there is uncontrollable nausea, vomiting, any concerning symptoms, seek care. Don't try and treat those things at home yourself without making sure that there's not something more important going on. Yeah, very good. Um, we've got another question that, that was submitted earlier. What can I do about a heavy period? Um, obviously, this is probably the most profound symptom that we notice if, if things mm -hmm. aren't quite right. So what about heavy periods? What, what can I do? Well, I think first of all is um, really making sure that we're being clear on what heavy is. So making sure that we're charting how much bleeding that we're having. And if you have questions on that, talk to a medical provider, look at various resources. I would say um, resources are kind of all over the place of what's heavy or what's normal. I would say like 30 to 80 milliliters, which different period products have that on there, period cups measure that. Um, so I think one being educated on what is heavy and what is normal. Um, but when you are having true heavy periods, uh, common causes, I would say, or things that I see a lot are when estrogen levels need to be addressed. So when we're having either conditions or exposures that are causing us to have higher estrogen levels related to progesterone. So again, estrogen is not only what builds our cervical mucus, but it also is what builds our uterine lining and progesterone is what stabilizes it. And then when we have our period, we're shedding that uterine lining. And so conditions like endometriosis, fibroids, polyps, those obviously have their own treatment. But if it just is a matter of estrogens, really making sure that again, we're looking at endocrine disruptors, removing those from our beauty products, our skincare products, our environment, and really making sure that we are adequately detoxing hormones in our bodies, paying attention to our gut health, our liver health. And then the other um, reason that I commonly see heavy periods is related to not ovulating regularly, which again makes sense. If we're having more regular estrogen exposure as we work towards ovulation, we're going to have a heavier building up of the uterine lining. Um, and so really that kind of depends on why are we not having regular ovulation. If it's PCOS, you know, looking at supplements to specifically address that. If it's stress, looking at things that support that, like, you know, making sure that we're doing yoga, meditation, mindfulness, considering vitamin C, maybe maitake or different things for our stress support system. Um, and inadequate nutrients can also cause this um, or low body weight, sometimes I see it. So really making sure that we're maintaining a healthy body weight, that we're optimizing our diet, getting ideally six to eight servings of fruits and vegetables in a day. Sometimes it can be helpful to avoid dairy. Um, and always, again, like those key pillars of health, making sure that we're looking at our sleep and making sure that we're getting adequate sleep. Yeah, okay. So I guess we're starting to get the picture here that that whatever's going on, there's this, mm -hmm. this underlying kind of, internal you know part of our body that needs to be supported in the same way no matter what it is how it's coming out in symptoms it's really starting from from deep within and it's great mm -hmm. that you've set these you know especially the five pillars as you've mentioned um, that no matter what's going on look at those things in our lives as a way to correct we've got another case study irregular cycles you mentioned irregular cycles um, mm -hmm. not ovulating regularly so let's have a look at a chart or what we would typically see in a chart if this is our experience. Is all, are all irregular cycles an indication of PCOS? 
So now they're not, I mean, it can be a symptom of PCOS, but also as we've talked about, stress can cause irregular cycles, having you know, various conditions like hypothalamic amenorrhea, over-exercising, under-nutrition. There's numerous different things that can cause us to have irregular cycles or to not be ovulating. And, you know, this chart is like a, a perfect example of that where we're having numerous builds up of estrogen um, that are not triggering ovulation. And so you see all of this buildup of estrogen, 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 but not followed by that decrease in cervical mucus and the high temp rise um, until maybe the end of the cycle mm -hmm. here, you know, we start to see that, but this is a really common pattern of uh, typically, this one has a lot of estrogen in it, I would say. Often we'll see more patches of estrogen no estrogen, estrogen, no estrogen, as our ovaries work to try and hit those adequate levels necessary to trigger our brain to ovulate. Mm -hmm. And so what can we do about irregular cycles? I would say really, it, again, depends on the underlying cause, regardless of the cause, those key pillars of hormonal health are gonna be helpful, especially I would say stress, paying attention to not over-exercise and really making sure not only that we're eating regularly and getting in nutrition, but that we're getting in enough calories and those macronutrients that are really necessary for cellular and ovulation health. Mm -hmm. And I think it can be something that if in dressing the key pillars of hormonal health, you're not able to get the cycle to regular parameters, then I do think testing or a workup with a medical provider to rule in or out PCOS, hypothalamic amenorrhea, pituitary tumors, thyroid conditions, different things that can actually be medical causes of irregular cycles. And then the nutrients and botanicals, again, that's really gonna depend on what the underlying medical condition is that comes out, or if it, you know, you have testing and those things come back negative, then really supporting your sleep, your stress cycles with like various herbs and botanicals for that. Very good. So another question that was submitted from our audience, is it a problem that my cycle is long, irregular, and menses are poor? In, in poor, she means like one pad per day, right. which isn't even close to full. So it's very light, what we would consider very light. There's no medium or heavy flow. Mm -hmm. Is that a problem? You know, I would say, again, like it's when we're talking about our cycles, why we want to see those regular patterns, like regular cycles, regular ovulation, having adequate, like seeing adequate hormone levels through an adequate bleed, an adequate buildup of cervical mucus and adequate luteal phase, again, is because regardless of what our goal is in the moment, our cycles are reflective of our hormonal health. The health of our estrogen and progesterone is reflective of the health, like in the slide that we went over previously, of our overall system. And so to me, it is concerning if this is something that's an ongoing pattern and is something that I would want to support, especially in talking about the long irregular cycle. Mm -hmm. In the lighter menses, I think, again, it would depend on like, what type of pad are you using? Are you using like a super pad and it's close to full and that's, you know, two, three days, that could be adequate. So I think menses, it kind of depends. Also, I find that depending on body size, so women that are more um, slight in body size, sometimes will have less bleeding. And so I think like it would depend on the menses, but definitely I would seek to support a body that was showing up with this. Yeah, absolutely. Another one is how can I plan for ovulation when I have irregular periods, most likely due to stress. So I guess, you know, irregular periods means irregular ovulation. So how could somebody plan for that? Um, 
yeah. how, how how do we kind of know ahead of time can we know ahead of time when ovulation <laughs> might come <laughs> yeah i with ovulation we can't right that's the the trick right but i um like a qa to see signs is to cycle chart that's one of the reasons we cycle chart and so when that's why when we see fertile cervical mucus we know that that may progress to ovulation i think um really working those key pillars of hormonal health and stress specifically in this case so considering things to really support stress if you suspect that's the cause of an irregular cycle is going to help but in planning for ovulation, really like cycle charting, watching for that fertile cervical mucus, you could consider doing LH testing, which can, um, not perfect, we can get false negatives, false positives, but can help us to know when we are likely to have ovulation impending. And really make sure that you're clear on method rules so that if you are somebody that's having irregular cycles, you know when you're fertile and when you're not as you're building up towards ovulation. I think those like rules, making sure that you really understand that through, you know, whether that's self-teaching a book, working with an instructor, I think really understanding the rules so that you know when it might be coming and when you're fertile and when you're not, if you're trying to avoid is super key too. Yeah, cool. But the message is always clear as we've already learned. It's, it's better that we work on getting that regular then Absolutely. try to live with irregular um and, mm -hmm. and guessing mm -hmm. what's the best way to improve overall health after birth control pills so if you've been on hormonal birth control you come off that what's the best mm -hmm. way to support this transition and improve our health um i love this question it's one of the ones that i work with people the most on. And I think like for me, there's always a couple things that I'm thinking about. One is like, what, why did we go on birth control in the first place? Because we want to be supporting that. So for example, if you went on it because you had PCOS and you were told to take it because you have irregular cycles, or if you had acne or PMS or painful periods, most of the time, unless we were doing something to improve the root causes and improve why we were having those symptoms, when we come off those symptoms are gonna be there. So I think really thinking of the root cause that you went on it for and making sure that you're supporting that in some way. And also understanding what happens to our bodies when we're on the pill. So when we're on the pill, um, studies have shown us that it depletes our bodies from various nutrients, so different B vitamins, vitamin C, E, magnesium, selenium, zinc, folate. Um, and also as we come off it, our bodies can um, become lower in vitamin D. So I find this is a really key time to focus on making sure that you're eating nutrient dense foods. So all of those leafy greens, those like phyto, nutrient rich fruits and veggies that are like really vibrant colors is always how I think of them. Berries and um, making sure that if you are going to have meat or dairy that it's organic so we're avoiding hormones um, and really you know like those like nutrient dense foods like nuts and seeds. Um, I personally recommend that clients at least consider taking a really high quality multivitamin that includes vitamin D at least for the first three to six months and coming off the pill so that we can replete those nutrients and really focusing, you know, on blood sugar balance is key, making sure that, you know, we're looking at those key pillars of health that always matter. Um, hormonal birth control also is, has shown negative effects on our gut microbiome. So either eating foods that are lacto-fermented probiotic foods or taking a probiotic can be really helpful in this transition time um, and really supporting our gut and our liver and our body to remove excess hormones and toxins um, is super key in this time. Like we're detoxifying is a big part of this. So really making sure that we're, you know, supporting the liver and the gut through that, that we're having regular bowel movements and 
you know, you can always consider doing various supplements or herbs that can support hormone balance. I personally like to try to support the body and doing that just through nutrition, maybe a multivitamin, maybe a probiotic. Um, but if you needed to, if you're not starting to see negative cycle effects or different things happening, then again, treating that underlying cause, depending on what's going on. Okay. So a bit more intense help and care for, sure. for the body during that time. For sure. So just to kind of sum up, um, going back to those key pillars of hormone health, run us through them again, just so that we can cement in what we all can do to support our yeah. menstrual cycle health. Yeah. So I'd say these are the things that I would write down somewhere and come back to. So gut and liver health, again, our gut, we have the estrobilum and um, part of our microbiome, super key in how much estrogen we are keeping within our body. So we want to keep that gut healthy, making sure that we're either taking a probiotic or eating probiotic foods regularly, having regular bowel movements, seeking help if you're noticing a lot of gut symptoms or a lot of hormone symptoms. Same with the liver, like supporting our liver, making sure that we are really keeping that healthy. There's you know, different herbs that can support liver health as well, but really key for that like hormone detoxification process, both of those with nutrition, really making sure that one, you're getting adequate calories and two, that you're looking at your macronutrients. So are you getting protein? Are you getting in healthy fats? Are you getting in those complex carbs and seven, you know, like six, seven to eight servings of fruits and vegetables a day? So sleep seven to nine hours every night, dark, cool, quiet making sure that we're getting in some type of ideally daily movement, but avoiding that over exercise as this can have negative cycle effects. And then really paying attention to supporting our stress levels and really completing those stress cycles. So when stress does come up, finding ways to really fully move that through our body. Okay, great tips. And then finally now with interventions, when, what should we do, you know, if, if things aren't ideal? Yeah. So I would say like when we start experiencing either symptoms that just aren't improving, despite us trying to do things on our own, more severe symptoms, um, or if you just want to understand your hormones and your cycles more, like one, keep charting, chart a lot of details. That's always something that's going to be helpful if you're you know, whether you're doing chart reviews with a fertility awareness educator or you're working with a medical provider that's aware of cycle charts, the more detail you have, the better. And um, again, seek medical care to rule out those serious conditions. Consider doing testing. So whether that is blood work, if there's imaging that your provider might recommend, I really love the Dutch test that gives you um, sex and adrenal hormones both. And then GI map is one that looks at gut microbiome testing. And those would just be some examples. And then I always encourage people to work with a holistic provider that is going to really empower you to find health and balance in your cycles, as opposed to the more traditional Western medical approach of just telling you to get on hormonal birth control because something is off. So ideally really seek out a provider that is going to support you in your cycle charting journey and your really like self-awareness, self-discovery journey. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much for joining us, um, mm -hmm. Dr. Mona, today. Um, obviously, if anybody watching has more questions, it might prompt some more questions. You can you can certainly reach out to us at TempDrop. Um, our website, tempdrop.com, we have an excellent selection of blog posts in there that you can continue to search you can contact us by email we're also on instagram facebook um, we've got a couple of we have an exploring temp drop group on facebook so that if you're thinking about buying temp drop you can come in there and, and ask questions um, yeah so we can find us there what about you dr mona if you if somebody wants to connect with you how can they find you yeah, so I included my website and Instagram and Facebook and um, yeah, like any of those are great resources. I 
do fertility awareness education mentorships. And I also do cycle chart reviews as well as the Dutch and GI map testing. So any questions, you can reach me on any of these or my email I didn't put in there, but it's uh, medicinewithmona at gmail.com. Okay, thank you so much. 